Well, I want to talk to you this morning. Eventually, we're going to get to Galatians 5, and we're going to talk about law, flesh, spirit, and freedom. Now, that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot in there that we could talk about. There's a lot in Galatians 5. There's a lot anywhere and everywhere in the New Testament about that, but we're going to look at that in just a moment, particularly. But I want us to look, beginning in John 8 here in just a moment first. Freedom is a wonderful blessing. We know that intellectually. We know that practically. We pray often for those who are fighting for our freedom. Some in this audience have fought for our freedom. There are people who die for our freedom. And I am grateful. I don't know that I fully appreciate that. I think I probably don't fully appreciate the sacrifice that so many people have gone through and continue to go through so that I can live in this country where we are free. I have made, uh, as you know, several trips to the Czech Republic. I have a good friend there who is a New Testament Christian named Hunza Novak. Hunza and I have become very good friends through my time there, and we obviously now can communicate fairly quickly in other ways, Facebook and in other ways, and we do that from time to time. Hunza was a university student. He was a part of a demonstration back in the late 80s and into the 90s called the Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic. At the time, it was Czechoslovakia. And Hunza told me about the time where he was marching in the streets and the police, the Russian soldiers, and those who were Czechs would come and would arrest. And he showed me the banner which he held when he himself was arrested. Now, he still has the banner. I took a picture of it, but as is my photographic skills, the picture didn't turn out real well. Plus, you, couldn't, you wouldn't have known what it said anyway. You just had to trust me. But when I talked to Hunza about it, and when I, as I looked on my first trip, and as I saw things that reminded him and things that I saw for the first time of what communism did to people for, for 41 years in that country. And I noticed in a bedroom I was staying in that night, there were about six books. And all of those books, the title all had Ronald Reagan in the title of the books. And so... On my last trip, when we talked about the Velvet Revolution and about his arrest, I said, what is it about Ronald Reagan that fascinates you? He said, we love Ronald Reagan. I said, well, why do you love Ronald Reagan like you do? He said, well, Ronald Reagan helped bring freedom to Czechoslovakia. And two years prior to that, what began in 1989, was when Mr. Reagan, who was the president at the time, appeared in Berlin and told Mr. Gorbachev to tear down this wall. That was 1987 at the Brandenburg Gate. And on November 9th, 1989, that Berlin Wall, which was 28 miles long, fell. People began to climb it. People began to topple it. People began to push it over. And those from the east came to those who from the west. And freedom was begun there. And that kind of thing led others in that part of the country to pursue freedom. Those stories fascinate me because I've never personally experienced that. I was born in a free country. I've lived all of my life in a free country. And while there are things about our country that I dislike, one of the great things about our country that I love is that we do live in a land of freedom. We are the land of the free, and we are the home of the brave. But there is a freedom that Jesus talks about that is a greater freedom that I personally think many times we don't appreciate like we should. Jesus talked about that in John the 8th chapter beginning in verse 31 when he said this. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, 
and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in his house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Well, these Jews had short memories. They looked at Jesus and said, we'd never been in bondage. That was about the farthest thing from the truth that they could have said. They'd been in bondage a lot in their history. But they were proud. And they didn't think that they were ever in bondage. And yet Jesus tells them and helps them understand that the only way you're not in bondage is that if you abide in my word. It is that truth that is in his word that will make you free. In verse 36, he reminds them, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus talks about freedom from sin. When I say that to you, does that mean anything to you? Does that, in your mind, preacher talk? Well, you know, he's talking about sin, and he's talking about the fact that we ought not do things, and that's kind of what preachers do. Well, Jesus talked about it in a very forceful way. He talked about being in bondage to it. He talked about... Sin separating one from God. And so this freedom from sin or the consequences that we face was pretty serious to Jesus and ought to be pretty serious from us. But this freedom is not the inability to sin. We're not free from sin in that we don't have the ability to sin. That never goes away. But, but what sin does, sin is a result of law. Without law, there's no sin. Sin is a result of breaking God's law. And the law creates lawbreakers. And the law gives out no mercy. It just makes one guilty. When you, and I know this would happen to none of us, but if you were to maybe once or twice in your life exceed the speed limit and a police officer pulls you over and he or she says, you were doing 55 in a 35. All of us understand what that is. And all of us understand that according to the law, we must pay the penalty. And if it's simply about law, that's what law says must happen. You have exceeded what the law said. You have broken the law. You're a lawbreaker, and you must pay the penalty. That's just in a nutshell what law is. There are the facets of that. But if that police officer looks at you and as you're wiping your tears away or as you're being nice or as you're bribing him. I shouldn't have said that. But as you're trying to eliminate the possibility of you receiving a ticket, he says to you, just slow down and don't exceed the speed limit. I'll not tell you how many times I have been the recipient of mercy. Nor would I ever tell you how many times I've been stopped by a police officer. Nor how many times I haven't been extended mercy. But when mercy is extended, it is a wonderful thing. Mercy is when I deserve a ticket but won't get what I deserve. It's not getting what I deserved, and that grace is getting what I don't deserve. And they're similar. And they're used not so much interchangeably in Scripture, but they're used to identify something that relates to that. But I want us this morning to look at a passage that I hope will help us appreciate what God through Christ has done for us from Galatians 5. So let me ask you to be turning there and let me mention some things from Galatians 5 that I believe will be and should be important to us. Jeremy read this morning from the first six verses or so of Galatians, the fifth chapter. And I think those are wonderful points to help us identify the fact that we need to be in Christ to have this advantage that says that law will not force us to obtain the penalty and to pay the penalty, but what Christ did is he, in essence, as Wade, I think, so very well reminded us this morning, he paid the price for us so that we would not have to pay it for ourselves. And I want us this morning to look at just five or six things from Galatians, the fifth chapter, that help us understand what it means. I'm not going to talk about the works of the flesh or the works of the Spirit. I am going to identify them, and I'm going to mention them. But I want us to look at maybe a more general way of thinking about how this relates to our lives today and what 
us walking in the Spirit and not according to the flesh is and why that's even important for us. So let's read before we make these points. Let's read from chapter 5 and verse 16 where Paul would say, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. That's the concept that's made pretty uh, clear in Romans the 7th and 8th chapter for us. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Well... When you become a Christian, you still fight the flesh. When I become a Christian, we still fight the flesh. We still deal with things in our lives that are at odds against each other. That's what Paul's first point would be in verse 17 when he says the flesh and the spirit are fighting against each other and they're fighting in us. The flesh pulls us one way. And I think he's referring to the Holy Spirit. He is leading us and he's helping us understand by what he has given us through his word. He's pulling us another way. In Romans the 8th chapter beginning in verse 12, Paul would say this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body... You will live for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. With the Spirit's help, we overcome. That's the nature of who we are. That's the nature of, I think, being led by the Spirit. So we understand this fighting back and forth in our flesh. Paul understood that very clearly. And I still understand it. You still understand it. It's a battle that we face each and every day. So Paul identifies that not only in Galatians, he identifies it in Romans, he identifies it in several places, but they are at odds against each other. So in verse 18 says this, says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Under the law, I think, is the idea. To be under the law means to reveal what sin is. With the law, you understand what sin is, and it condemns the sinner. So under the law, you're condemned. That's all you are. You can't have it any other way. But look in Romans, the 8th chapter, and notice this is, this is one of those great spiritual blessings that we read about and we, we think about, but I don't think we fully appreciate. In Romans 8, notice what he says in verse 1. Paul would say, There is therefore... Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There, in Christ, there is no condemnation. It doesn't mean that if you're in Christ, you can't be lost. It means that in Christ, as you're walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, you're not under condemnation. That's a great blessing. It's as if when the policeman stops you, and he says you're guilty, you know you're guilty, but you also know you're not going to be condemned. You're not going to be considered a lawbreaker because that's, not, that's really not who you are. Now you may break the law, and I'm not suggesting that everything in terms of, of our laws and the laws of God are necessarily the same, but the idea is there. So Romans 8 tells us that we are free from condemnation. We are free from sin and death. And we are free according to this, and look at verse 3 of Romans 8, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. We just can't do that 
God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Do you want that? Do you, do you want the ability to even though you're not living in sin, but even though you do sin. It, it, it's, it's, it's who we are. We, we are sinners. And, and even though we're trying to avoid the flesh and not walk in the flesh, sometimes we make mistakes. He says you need to be walking in the Spirit. And when you do that, then what God has done for you is that penalty. He's paid that penalty through His Son. It's the very thing that Wade said to us this morning. That's the great advantage that we have in being in Christ. And a person who's not in Christ does not have that advantage. And if we fulfill the lust of the flesh, and if we live that way, according to verse 19 of Galatians 5, we will face a stiff penalty. Paul would say the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. And he goes on to talk about those things. And in verse 21 he says, Just as I told you in time past, that those who practice practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm just going to ask you this very pointedly today. Do you practice any of those things? Because if you do, according to what the inspired message says, if you practice those things, you're not going to be with God in eternity. You're not. That, that's not a judgment that I've made. That's a judgment that God has said He's made on your behalf. What He's done through His Son is not something that's going to be, that, that's going to, he, he can't come to your aid in that. The, the very thing that we memorialize this morning, the fact that He died for us, ought to make us think each and every time we take the Lord's Supper, because of what He did, I don't have to face the penalty for my sin because of what He's done. But if, if you're fulfilling that and you say, you know, I don't care about what God has done for me and I sure don't care what Christ has done for me through his sacrifice, you have no hope. You have no hope. And so the fulfilling of the flesh and the lust of the flesh comes with stiff penalty if we're not in Christ. I want you to, to understand that. And then, of course, the fruit of the Spirit is our aim. He talks about that. There's, there's no penalty. Verse 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. I mean, he's simply saying there is no penalty for those things. There's no penalty. There's no law against that. There's no law that would, that would create a penalty for that. As a matter of fact, there is a reward for being the kind of people that God wants us to be. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is those things that we're trying to develop in our life. So just like looking at the list of the works of the flesh and the lust of the flesh, I would say look at the fruit of the Spirit and say, are you producing that in your life? And we might look at that and we might go, well, you know, those are pretty easy. Not so fast. Self-control. You know, we look at self-control and we say, well, I don't beat my wife. Well, that's really good. I'm proud of you. You ought not do that. But there's a little bit to self-control more than I don't hit somebody. It's getting, getting myself under control in whatever ways I need to control myself. And it's having the kindness, and it's having long-suffering and love and joy and peace. Can you say this morning, oh, that's what I do? I'm, I'm not suggesting you can't, but I'm saying, don't just look at that and say, you know, I'm a Christian, I have that. I don't think it's quite that easy. He's talking about, is this the kind of person you are? It's not a checklist to say, I have it, I have it, I have it, I have it. It's, who am I? And, and this is the kind of person I am. And so I think we need to think as sharply and as strongly and as objectively about the fruits of the Spirit as we do the lust of the flesh. We don't need to deceive ourselves into thinking we don't do one and we very easily and very well do the other. We need to ask ourselves very seriously if that's what's a part of our lives habitually.
And then verse 24 tells us that those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh. And to that I would say, if you're in Christ this morning, the question becomes, have you crucified the flesh? And what, what Paul is saying, and I think what Jesus is encouraging us and asking us and really demanding of us is that if we are in Christ, we, have, we need to have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. Those are, who are in Christ have crucified the flesh. And I will tell you about that. And you know this. This is not something that you have to say, well, Kenny, can you tell me about that? It's hard to crucify the flesh. It's hard to crucify the flesh. It's hard to crucify those passions that, that, that raise their heads. And, and, and Jesus says, and Paul says, if you're going to live for me according to the Spirit, you need to do that. Verse 13 of Romans 8 says this, if you, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's what we are asked to do. Look over in the companion passage to Ephesians in Colossians 3 beginning in verse 5. Where Paul would say this, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Does that sound pleasant to you? You know, here I'm involved in these things. As a Christian, I may be involved in these things. And what Paul says is, well, if you're involved in those things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. See the idea there? The idea is, this is what I practice. I walked in them. I've lived in them. This is how I was. And as a Christian, Paul says, you need to crucify that. Listen, you can't be a Christian and live the same way you lived before. Not if the lust of the flesh are part of your life. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger and wrath. Look at these, anger and wrath and malice. Is all that easy? You say, well, no, I do that all the time. Do you? Anger and wrath and malice? Is that away from you? Blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all in all. That, that is language that's straight out of Ephesians 4. That old man, new man stuff. And it's important. So I have to ask myself, have I crucified the flesh? And then finally this point. If we live by the Spirit, we must walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit. I think that's if we have new life because of the Holy Spirit's work in convicting us of sin. That's part of what He did. He came into the world to convict the world of sin. We, we don't know what sin is without what the Holy Spirit has done for us. He has manifested that to us. He has revealed that through us. We have that through His Word. We understand what sin is. So if we live by the Spirit, if, if our lives as Christians is a result of what the Spirit has done, He says, then we must walk in the Spirit as well. We should be changed people. Not walking in sin, but walking in the Spirit. And if you're in Christ, the law does not condemn you. Now there are some people who take that to say, you know, once you're in Christ, you don't need to worry about anything else. And, and, and we discussed that some last Sunday evening about how God used that. But there is, there is a safety <coughs> There is, a, there, there is something to the point that there is no condemnation in Christ. That's what Paul would say in Romans 8. I think that's what Paul is saying here in Galatians 5. May I just ask you this question? And it's a, It really is a rhetorical question. But aren't you glad the law of Christ doesn't condemn you? Aren't you glad that you can sit here this morning honoring and worshiping the very king whom you have committed to? You've committed your life to, not because you've said, I'm going to live perfectly, but because you've said, I'm going to do my best to walk by the Spirit. And as a child of God, I'm going to avoid the best I can the works of the flesh. And when I fail, I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and I'm going to commit to doing better. That's what it means. That's what it means, it seems to me, to be walking by the Spirit. Turn, turn over to 1 Peter. Let me close with by looking at this point. Look at 1 Peter, the fourth chapter. 1 Peter 4. Somebody says, well, Kenny, 
that, all that, all those things you're talking about, those lust of the flesh. That that I deal with that all the time. Well, let me let me just share a little something with you. I do too. That's, there's nobody immune from it. But but what Peter reminds us of in First Peter four is here's how here's how we overcome that. Look at First Peter four, beginning in verse one. Therefore. Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now he goes on to enumerate what all those things are. And he says in verse 3, we've spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. But that's not how we act anymore. We don't want to live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And that happens, verse 1 says, by arming ourselves with the mind of Jesus Christ. Do you know why you and I, part of why you and I are here this morning? Part of why we're here is to try to figure out how we do better. Every time we meet, every time we study, every time we open our Bibles, whether it's here at home in a Bible class, wherever it is, every time we're doing that, we're doing that to try to be better so that we arm ourselves with the mind of Christ. How else are you going to get that? How else are you going to get the mind of Christ other than continue to find out what it is that he and his apostles wanted you to know through his Holy Spirit? How else are we going to get that? I'm grateful that the law of Christ doesn't condemn me. Law condemns. But law can only do so much, and Christ has been willing and has chosen to do more. And what I have to do is try to abide in that to the best of my ability. Well, I hope that lesson will be meaningful to you, and I hope it will be practically meaningful to you. I, I think it's important. I, I do think it's important for us from time to time to look at those lists. I, there are several places in the New Testament where the lust of the flesh and where other lists are mentioned, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 5. Other places in Paul's letters, Jesus would talk about some of those things. But I think it's important for us to stand the value of walking according to the Spirit. Don't walk according to the flesh. Don't walk according to the flesh so that you can't be condemned. But live according to the Spirit so that there's no condemnation for sin. I thank God that I not only have the opportunity to live that way, but I thank God on a regular basis that I have an opportunity to offer that to everybody who's willing to listen. I can stand before you today and say, not because I have the power, but because he has the power, God can release you from the sin that is destroying your life. And that's what it's doing, whether you know it or not. He can release you from that. He can't stop you from sinning. And even if you come to him, he can't stop you from continuing to sin. But what he says is that if you'll walk by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, and you'll find no condemnation because you're in me. That's a great blessing, folks. That's a great blessing. And if you'd like to achieve that this morning, you need to be in Christ. And the only way that the New Testament teaches that a person can be in Christ is not by simply saying, I want to be in Christ. You can acknowledge that. Matter of fact, you're going to have to acknowledge that. You're going to have to acknowledge the fact that that's what you want to be. But there are some things he asks of you if you want your faith to be an obedient faith. And one thing he says is you need to be buried with him in baptism so that your sins can be washed away. We've talked about that in recent weeks as well. I don't see any way around that. And I would encourage you today to do that. And then commit yourself to walking by the Spirit. It may be that there are people here this morning who say, well, Kenny, I'm a Christian, but I sure haven't been living like I ought to live. You really need to think about that. And if you've rebelled against God and you're just living like you want to live because that's what you want to do, you ought to do something about that before it's too late. <coughs> and we would encourage you to do that. We'd love to help you if you have a spiritual need this morning, if you'd come as we stand and as we sing.